We are continuing our talks on the everyday life of ancient Greeks and ancient Romans, and more specifically on the food culture and cuisine of classical antiquity. Today we will speak about Roman cuisine, of what they ate and how they ate, how they were or weren't different from ancient Greeks, what they borrowed from them, and what actually the history of this ancient food culture is. The title of this talk is Tramalchio's Dinner, or what ancient Romans would have on their tables. It is a bit provocative, because Tramalchio was a fictional character from Satyricon. It was written by Petronius, who lived in the first century AD. As this is a work of fiction, we cannot be sure that everything he describes as the contents of Tramalchio's table was actually on the tables of, his con of people who lived at that time of his contemporaries. First of all, we need to think of the sources that we have on the subject. What can support our judgment? First of all, uh, there are literary sources, and secondly, there are material evidence. Many of the contemporaries wrote about cuisine, banquets, and feasts. Many writers from ancient Rome and, Rome and also from classical antiquity. For example, we have fantastic biographies of Roman emperors. Each work, each line helps us shape the picture, the panorama of Roman life, of Roman banquets, Roman cuisine. Yet one of the most famous names who will help us here will be the name of Marcus Gabius Apicius, writer, author, or maybe just a culinary specialist, whose work made him really famous. It is called On the Subject of Cooking, the Re Culinaria. Sometimes this work is referred to as a cookbook. It, it is a, a collection of recipes a very detailed account of the Roman cuisine. There are numerous adaptations of his recipes that have come down to our times thanks to the books of Apicius. One can use those recipes and thus become part of the old tradition of Roman cuisine. Here you can see a fictionous, uh, a fictional portrait of Apicius because no known images of him survived. Here you can see an engraved portrait, front page and cover of several editions of his book, which was uh, published and republished starting from the 16th century. He is an important author. His work on the art of cooking was very famous, and we cannot do without this author if we speak about food and food culture of ancient Romans. The second important source of evidence for us is the vast amount of material evidence, material objects that have survived through the centuries and have come down uh, to our time. It is impossible to discuss the everyday life of ancient uh, Romans without mentioning this evidence. It is the dinnerware, cookware and utensils that ancient Romans used. It is the construction of the kitchen, the construction of the dining room in ancient Rome, and so on and so forth. A huge number of such objects have survived from ancient Rome of the first centuries BC and the, the first century AD. And how did those objects survive? South Italy, Rome and such cities of the Bay of Naples as Herculaneum, Pompeii and Stabiae have suffered a terrible catastrophe in 79 AD. It was the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and this catastrophe turned out to be a real gift for future generations. Not only scholars, Common people are also very curious about the past. They would like to know more about everyday, everyday life of uh, past. On the 24th August of the year 79, the cities of the Bay of Naples, 
Herculaneum, Pompeii, Stabae, and some others were buried under a thick layer of volcanic ash and thus became imprisoned for centuries and even millennia. They remained covered, buried in ash until the 18th century, because starting from 1711 and more regularly from 1738, the city of Herculaneum was uh, excavated, followed by excavations in Pompeii. Today, researchers are starting to change their mind about the exact date of the eruption. They think that probably Mount Vesuvius erupted not in August, but late in September or even October. As a result of this eruption, the cities, ancient cities, uh, remained almost intact. And after the excavations started, they have revealed us the uh, the cities, the streets, the houses, with lots of tableware still standing on the tables in the kitchens, so that we could imagine how it actually was in ancient times. Most of the citizens managed to leave the place, but uh, definitely there were people who uh, could not escape from Pompeii and Herculaneum. So during the excavations, the researchers started to fill in the hollows, empty places where the bodies used to be with gypsum, which produced casts of human bodies uh, of the people who could not escape from the city, as well as the animals who were at place at the moment when the cities perished. Excavations still continue in Pompeii, in Herculaneum, and especially in Stabi, where also the State Hermitage Museum uh, participates. These excavations have already revealed a lot of material, almost all of the cities, but still there are some places not uncovered yet and uh, keeping their story. So what actually the work of archaeologists and researchers gave to us? We can walk the streets of Pompeii, we can look into the houses, we can see magnificent, magnificent theater for 5,000 uh, people, the so-called large theater in Pompeii. We can also see, uh, see a huge amphitheater, which accommodated 20,000 viewers. We can see large palestra, it is a space for outdoor sports, where athletes trained. We can actually look into the public baths, that was the most popular place for uh, spending time and for communication in ancient Rome. We can actually see and feel the everyday life of those people. Uh, when walking through the streets, we can see uh, street fountains that were decorated with sculpture. And finally, look into the Roman kitchen. Uh, for example, we can see the bakeries. The ancient city of Pompeii was relatively small. It is considered to uh, have had 12,000 uh, citizens, and there were approximately 24,000 people living uh, in the suburbs around the city. So in this uh, relatively small city, uh, there were 34 bakeries and 89 thermopolia, so-called thermopolia, were discovered there. So what is actually a thermopolium? So what exactly is a thermopolium? It is, so to speak, a public kitchen or cook shop where people could go and buy hot food, bring it home and spare themselves from cooking. Using our contemporary language, um, thermopolia uh, also had uh, so-called bars where visitors could stay for a while. Not only the Thermopolia themselves were discovered in the city of Pompeii, but also depictions of such Thermopolia. As you can see in the fresco which was discovered uh, on the wall of the so-called Osteria della Via di Mercurio. On this fragment we can see visitors of the Thermopolium sitting at the table. We can also see a boy who is carrying food on the wall there are bundles of cheese and sausages. When we look at this fresco, we can uh, 
Imagine that we actually are physically in the thermopolium which was discovered during the excavations. And thus we have uh, various evidence of what actually Romans ate and how cooking was organized through all these uh, fascinating discoveries. The ancient cities of Pompeii, Herculaneum and Stabi are unique also because um, numerous frescoes, wall paintings have survived there, um, covering various topics. Monumental painting, fresco painting, which was discovered in the 18th century, and frescoes are still being discovered, are a completely uh, separate uh, page in the uh, story of uh, classical art. But the lavish, magnificent wall painting uh, from Pompeii is uh, out of comparison. As we can see, there were images of Thermopolia on the walls of Thermopolia. There were images of bread, bread loaves, uh, in, on the walls of uh, the small shops. On the walls of vegetable and fruit shops, we find images of fruit and vegetables. And these images are priceless fragments of antique painting, as represented uh, by the wall paintings from Pompeii of the first centuries BC up to the first century AD, as long as we know the exact date uh, when Pompeii perished, it was 79 AD. On one of the fresco fragments we can see a bronze jug and bronze dish with eggs, uh, there is some uh, fowl on the wall. On the other fragment we can see a glass vessel, a glass vase with uh, fruit and uh, um, apples and grapes. Uh, on another piece we can see a beautiful uh, glass bowl with handles, completely filled in with pomegranates. In the basket next to it there are figs, one of the most favorite uh, fruit in ancient Greece and in the Roman times. Not only wall painting, but also mosaics, a lot of mosaics survived in Pompeii. And on one of the mosaics, which is currently in Vatican, you can see this fish hanging on the wall next to some fowl and uh, um, a bunch of dates, asparagus and uh, various sea creatures. Ray and octopus are depicted on the beautiful mosaic also um, found in Pompeii, which is currently in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. So through all those images discovered uh, during the excavations of Pompeii, for example, using the uh, work of Apicius, as well as the evidence from the uh, classical authors, we can now discuss uh, such question as what could be found at the Roman market, or what did ancient Romans actually eat? One of the most important products were uh, grain, bread and legumes. Not, not only bread alone was produced from the grain, but I will speak about it a bit later, but also porridges and uh, uh, from different kinds of grain. There was barley porridge, there was wheat porridge from different sorts of gray, grain uh, wheat. And uh, there was also porridge called pulse. Uh, it was a very simple porridge that uh, quite uh, common people could afford for breakfast. It was made of grain, water and salt. Another one was Punic porridge, a bit more tasty, we can suppose, because it contained grain, honey, cheese and eggs. Apart from porridges, uh, basic ration of uh, ancient Romans as well as Greeks included bread. Bread, as I already mentioned, was produced from different kinds of uh, wheat flour. There was uh, fine flour or uh, more coarse flour, therefore uh, more tasty bread and more coarse bread. Of course, there were dairy products, cheese, poultry and eggs, fowl, piglets, lambs, smoked bacon, pork, ham, fish and seafood. And of course the ingredients of the so-called Mediterranean triad, because cuisines of ancient Greeks and Romans were actually a Mediterranean cuisine, which uh, still exists today. So these were bread, olive oil and wine. 
Also, there were various vegetables and fruit. In some books, there are descriptions of vegetables that accompanied different uh, dishes, and they are uh, very long. They sometimes enumerate almost all vegetables that we still consume today. All dishes were accompanied by pastes and sauces. Uh, the most well-known paste is uh, the so-called maritim. It is a paste, a uh, bread spread, which many people still eat today, uh, uh, containing cheese, garlic and oil. And there is one sauce which is very famous from antiquity. It is a fermented sauce made from fish, made on the basis of food intestines, and it is called garum. And, of course, Romans used spices and herbs, such as uh, black pepper, both whole and crushed, uh, such as silphium, which we mentioned last time. It was very valuable and highly expensive, and we remembered about Caesar, who uh, at a certain moment um, bought half a ton of silphy and uh, paid half a ton of silver for it. Such was the popularity of this uh, spice. They also used ginger, cardamom, cinnamon and many others. Could buy at the Roman market would be impossible to consume without a cup or a glass of wine. So what did ancient Romans drink? First and foremost, wine. And here are the kinds, the sorts of Roman wine that were most popular and famous. There was Alban wine from the Alban hills south to Rome. There was a wine called Massicum from the slow, slopes of Monte Massico in Campania. There was another uh, wine, Sarentinum, wine from Sorrento. And finally, the two most well-known source of wine, white Falernian wine from Campania. Best Falernians were of, deep, were of deep amber color. And finally, the Caicobum wine, white wine from the Caicobum south of Rome. All these wines are listed by antique authors. All are to be found in poetry. But Falernian wine is uh, probably the best known to the Russian audience because it is mentioned in the famous novel by Mikhail Bulgakov, Ma The Master and Margarita. And of course there were less elaborate, simple wines, for example, Posca, or uh, so-called wine of the legionnaires. It was not exactly wine, it was a mixture of water and sour wine, almost vinegar, with some spices. Alongside with spice, salt was also added. We don't know why, but perhaps uh, that was uh, just to disinfect the water in the drink. Coming back to food, we must, uh, of course, think about bread. Uh, Bread was really important. There was a saying that bread is the stuff of life. On this fragment of the Pompeian fresco, we can see the scene of distribution of bread. Uh, meat loaves are uh, almost cut in eight pieces. To make them easily uh, divided. Uh, here you can also see a, a kind of model of the bread, which was also discovered in Pompeii. Bread would be consumed uh, with various pastas and spreads. Uh, one was already mentioned, it was uh, called maritim. And uh, it is something that uh, could constitute the whole breakfast. Um, a piece of bread with maritim, uh, which was actually cheese, oil and garlic. Bread and images of bread uh, can be found on the fresco from, from Pompeii. But there is one more uh, amazing monument, an architectural monument connected with bread. Uh, it is a tomb a huge architectural construction, a uh, famous uh, tomb of Marcus Virgilius Eurysarchus, the baker. Eurysarchus was a freedman, a former slave, 
who made a fortune and became uh, famous as a baker. This tomb uh, stands uh, in Rome, not far from Porta Maggiore, and it looks quite strange, quite peculiar. It is possible that the base and the central part are made of, um, of ovens, um, oven mouth, because uh, Eurysakos was a baker. There is a relief that runs along the top of the tomb, and it represents various stages of bread production. And here you can see reconstruction of the scenes from this relief. Um, the uh, story starts uh, from delivery and grinding of grain and uh, sifting of flour. Um, then uh, you can see mixing and uh, kneading of dough, forming of round loaves, and then baking uh, bread in an oven. And finally putting those loaves of bread in baskets. It is an important, both historic and artistic evidence of uh, how bread was produced in the ancient Rome. And now we shall speak about uh, tableware, cookware and utensils that were used to uh, eat the food that we have already discussed. Here on screen you can see a large cauldron or cortina in Latin. It is a vessel for cooking. It is a large, quite regular cauldron uh, made of bronze uh, in the 3rd, 1st uh, centuries uh, BC. And it really was an important uh, kitchen utensil uh, because it was used for boiling products. Such type of vessel was used for cooking all over the ancient world. From the inside, such cauldrons very often had a special coating, uh, they were tin-plated. Cauldrons could be made from different metals, but here on screen we can see a bronze example. Another type of cookware, which was to be found in the households of almost all Romans, were the so-called situlae. Um, bucket-shaped vessels. Here you can see examples of uh, such situlae of the 1st uh, to 4th centuries AD found in uh, different location, locations. Uh, they have handles uh, and they can be of cylindrical form or sometimes with oval body and sometimes the place where the handle was attached to the body it was decorated with uh, figurines or reliefs, like on this uh, cetula, we can see a uh, head of Selenus. Food could be cooked in, very manis, uh, in various ways, and for example here we can see a frixorium, ancient Roman frying pan. It is quite deep and it has a special handle. Uh, bronze pans were found at the Villa Graniana, and now they uh, kept in the uh, Museum of Pompeii. It looks absolutely contemporary piece of uh, cookware. Special cauldrons were used for heating liquids, as the one represented here in the uh, shape of a small temple. It is a cylindrical vessel with lid decorated with uh, fine figurines uh, with small doors on the side. The doors are opened as if we can enter the sanctuary or a temple, and the deities, uh, patrons of the temple, are uh, depicted on the top of it. Next to it, you can see a device for uh, heating liquids, um, a kind of small stove. We understand that at the bottom there is a special o opening where we can place a kind of stove and uh, heat this cauldron uh, to make some hot water for porridge or maybe pour it into wine or prepare some other drink. To pour water from one vessel into another, special scoops were used and here you can see um, this uh, scoop which was called in Latin patera. Sometimes people believe that patera is a kind of uh, pan, a frying pan, but we know that for frying pans there was a special title and they had a different shape, uh, which is more common for this type of cook cookware. Here you can see a patera from the collection of the State Hermitage Museum. 
It was uh, found in copper. It is made of bronze and has beautiful ornament on it. Pottery or clay vessels were majorly used for drinking. Um, while uh, in the later times, um, vessels for drinking were also started to be produced with, uh, from different materials, not only from clay. And here you can see an array of drinking cups. Uh, they come from Britannia and date uh, back to the 3rd century AD. Here you can see a plate, a bowl, a mug, a cup for drinking, or small vessels for perhaps pastes or sauces. You can see all different shapes. To eat food, uh, plates were used, and the Latin name for a plate is catenum. Here we can see several plates of the first century AD. Almost flat, flat plate, um, a bowl uh, on a uh, special stand with vertical uh, poles uh, that look quite contemporary. We can understand that shapes of plates um, uh, are coming to our time from Romans. It is wonderful that something that uh, had been invented by uh, ancient masters uh, managed to remain until our days. Tableware was produced not only from clay, also from other materials, as I mentioned, for example, uh, of glass. Uh, here you can see a glass uh, dish, which uh, uh, resembles the shape of a, a clay plate or a clay dish. This is, of course, a very fragile material, but it is wonderful that this dish has uh, been uh, preserved intact. Uh, it uh, dates back to the first century AD. Romans would eat different kinds of food. For example, they ate a lot of fish. And uh, to eat fish, uh, they had fish dishes. These are dishes that had been used by the Greeks as you remember. And here on screen uh, you can see a wonderful fish dish which was produced in Athens. Greek ta tableware, uh, Greek dishes and vases were known in Rome, but they were not used as widely as in Greece. From Rome we uh, know majorly Roman ceramics uh, produced uh, in the first uh, centuries BC. And if we see examples of the 6th, 5th or 4th centuries BC, uh, these examples are usually pieces that uh, were produced on the territory of Italy, on the Apennine Peninsula, or in the Greek co uh, colonies on the territory of Magna Graecia. This is a wonderful example of attic work of the 4th century BC with the images of uh, various fish. It is obvious that the painter uh, was familiar with these fish very well because they have uh, depicted them in all detail. There are uh, five uh, large uh, fishes on the outer rim of the dish. Uh, there are several, seven small dish uh, fish and three shellfish. We can recognize them easily, uh, a sea bass, next to it a uh, uh, sea scorpion with uh, large eyes, and in between of them there is a small pilchard. In the center of the fish dish there is a dent. It is possible that it was uh, used for sauces or for salt, but in any way uh, this dish was specifically designed to make it comfortable to eat fish. And here is another example of fish dish with fish on it, uh, though we think it is a dish, but in fact it is a bottom of the red-figured licana a large vessel which uh, sometimes uh, could be covered with a big lid. And here we can see a dolphin among different sea creatures. 
Again, it is obvious that the painter was very well familiar with these uh, different types of fish, and despite this very easy, elegant, free drawing, we can um, understand, we can recognize uh, all of these uh, creatures. Here we see more examples of a fish dish that were produced on the territory of Apulia, uh, a region of uh, South Italy. Uh, where the masters produced uh, pottery um, in imitation of uh, Greek pottery. Sometimes it was an imitation of earlier type, type of ceramics, sometimes they would mimic uh, contemporary ceramics. But Apulian school has a distant feature to it. We can very easily re recognize this school because painters here um, used a lot of white paint or so-called coating and the drawing itself is uh, more vivid, more expressively laid on the surface of the dish. This type of drawing does not demonstrate the austerity, uh, the chastity of the drawing which was characteristic of the uh, Greek vases from the 5th century BC. As I already mentioned, all dishes were accompanied by sauces. And uh, the first place among the sources was uh, occupied by the so-called garum. This sauce was made from the fish intestines, salt, as well as herbs and spices. Um, the uh, fish intestines would be left to dry in the sun for several hours, after which they turned into this spicy paste. But it was very uh, important when making this sauce uh, to find the balance between the quantity of fish and quantity of salt, because if you add too little, uh, fish would uh, de deteriorate and uh, there would be no sauce. And if you take too much salt, then the process of fermentation uh, would not start. So those who produced this uh, garum sauce were definitely professionals. There were several degrees of quality for this product, for this sauce. And here you can see a mosaic of the first century AD from Pompeii, on which uh, there is uh, an inscription saying that this is one of the, uh, one of the four uh, best source uh, uh, of the garum sauce. Here you can also see examples of the vessels that were used to transport and to store this sauce made of clay. Um, they, uh, so to say, resemble Greek vessels, balsamariums with protruding long neck. Very often on the Roman tables and in the Roman kitchen, uh, we could see objects, uh, which uh, pieces that were made in the technique, the so-called terra sigillata, or rather terra sigillata, which can be translated as sealed earth or clay bearing little images. It is a red gloss pottery with relief decoration thrown in pottery molds. As these kinds of vessels, these cups were made by impression, um, by printing, imprinting something in clay, uh, hence the name, clay bearing little images. Such type of dishes was uh, produced for a very short period of time, well, relatively short, for about 100 years, from 50th BC to 50th AD. But they were widely spread across the ancient world, and such type of cups is to be found in the excavations in different parts of the world, in different countries, where Romans have ever set their foot on. We have already seen examples of not only pottery and clay uh, vessels, but also glass uh, vessels, uh, glass plate, and here you can see some glass bowls. Uh, their shape is similar to the one that we have seen just now. Uh, this is Roman glass of the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. Ancient Romans would drink from cups, mugs and beakers that were made of clay and uh, glass, as we have already seen, as well as of different metals, but majorly of silver. 
such, such type of uh, cups was called calyx. Here you can see uh, cups of different shapes and of different materials. To bring wine to the table, um, ferry were used, and as well as jugs and pitchers, uh, similar to cantharis, um, Greek vases, Greek amphorae, uh, but also they used uh, single-handed, one-handed uh, pitchers, as the one that we can see here, or the one made of glass. Um, vessels of this shape also can be found in different centers of uh, antique world. And they are important for us because they demonstrate that all kinds of different materials uh, were made for this type of um, tableware. And what type of uh, utensils did the ancient Romans use at the table? Here you can see a unique Roman relief uh, with a depiction of a sort of shop and very uh, many different knives. Perhaps it was a kind of advertisement, because on this relief you can see various shapes and various types of knives are used for different purposes. Such type of household knives were called in Latin coulter. Coulters could vary in shape and size, and they could have different names, depending on the purpose of this uh, utensil. There, there were knives that were used at the table, there were knives for different crafts, for example, we can see uh, um, the one for gardening or uh, for tailor's work. And next to it, some cutting device. Romans also had knives that look very modern. Foldable knives and other utensils. Here you can see uh, one made of iron with an uh, iron blade and bronze handle of the uh, first centuries AD and another one with a handle made of uh, ivory, which was uh, found, uh, discovered in the Roman Britannia, and uh, it dates back to the first centuries AD. Apart from knives, uh, Romans also used forks at the table. When we discussed Greek cuisine and Greek tableware, we did not uh, speak about utensils at all. When the Greeks ate, for example, soup, they could use bread or a, a hard flat bread as a sort of uh, spoon. As for Romans, here we can see all different kinds of forks that were used in the first century AD, um, from the first to the fourth centuries AD. Forks made of bronze, copper and silver. Forks could be combined with spoons, and here you can see this uh, kind of uh, utensil, when in instead of the handle, a spoon would have a fork at the end. Surprisingly, uh, Romans also had these peculiar folding or fo foldable knives, or foldable spoons and forks combined together. Here you can see a piece uh, of very good uh, state of preservation in a very good condition. Uh, it is made of silver and it is exhibited in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. So there were knives, there were forks and there were spoons. And now we are going to see uh, several shapes of them. They were both large and uh, big and they were called cochlearia and ligula. Spoons could be produced of bronze, of silver, um, they were of different uh, shapes, of different varieties, and they were found in abundance in the uh, silver treasures, of which we are going to speak a little bit later. And now let us discuss uh, the way in which meals were actually organized, the space where the meal was taken. If you remember, uh, the Greek feast or symposium was always held at the male part of the house, which was called Andron, where only men lived. So symposiums were organized in the dining room uh, on the territory of Andron, while uh, ancient Romans had already special rooms, which they called tricliniums, 
In such dining room a triclinium, in the center there was usually a table, it was a common table, and on the three si sides of it um, there were uh, three cleaners or couches. Here on the screen you can see um, uh, the triclinium in the so-called house of Neptune and Amphitrite in Herculaneum. It is an important evidence of how a uh, Roman triclinium was organized. Most importantly, here in this building uh, we have mosaics on the walls. And one of the central mosaics shows Neptune, god of the seas, and his uh, wife Amphitrite, hence the name of the house. Uh, here you can see reconstruction in the uh, contemporary museums uh, which allows um, us to imagine how this triclinium actually looked like. Uh, and it is a reconstruction of cleaner, a couch, where ancient Romans uh, were reclining. Again, we have uh, very many evidence that uh, were discovered, for example, in the Pompeii. Triclinium was attended in the second part of the day. When we spoke about Greeks, uh, we have uh, evidence that ancient Greeks uh, had four meals a day, two uh, breakfast and lunch, then dinner, and then supper, which was uh, followed and ended with a symposium. While Romans would usually have three meals a day, well, definitely they could also have lunch, but uh, um, Yes, we can say that there were four meals, but lunch was actually in the uh, middle of the day, while dinner uh, would shift closer to the evening. So, so starting from 4 p.m., this dinner would very slowly and very easily shift into an evening meal, evening feast. Sometimes uh, this feast would continue uh, from early evening until the morning. What happened at such feasts, at such banquets? How were they organized? Uh, here we have evidence, as I have already mentioned, from Petronius, uh, the dinner of Trimalchio, as well from, as, uh, from the biographies of Roman emperors. Biographies of uh, Roman emperors uh, were left to us by such uh, great authors as Suetonius or Tacit, and uh, from this uh, work we can, for, for example, find out about um, one of the very bright examples of, uh, of Roman gourmands. It was Aulus Vitilius, uh, an emperor who lived in the middle and uh, second uh, part of the first century AD. Here you can see a small quotation from Suetonius, who describes Vitellius. The most famous was a set entertainment given him by his brother, at which it is said they were served up to no less than 2,000 choice fishes and 7,000 birds. Yet even this supper he himself outdid, at a feast which he gave upon the first use of a dish which had been made for him, and which, for its extraordinary size, he called the shield of Minerva. In this dish there were tossed up together the livers of carfish, the brains of pheasants and peacocks, with the tongues of flamingos and the entrails of lampreys, which had been brought in ships of war as far as, pro as from the Carpathian Sea and the Spanish Straits. The reign of Vitellius was very short, Actually, he reigned in the year which is uh, called the year of four emperors. And uh, after, that, uh, the, after that, the next emperor was already Vespasian. Perhaps this short reign can be explained by, by his way of living, uh, his gluttony, so to say. Because as we know from ancient authors, he would spend time in uh, lavish idleness and feasts, uh, and sometimes he would turn up in the middle of the day drunk. Vitellius organized uh, feasts three, four times a day for the guests of the imperial palace. 
Uh, and actually, so to say, uh, such manner, such reign was not a unique um, episode in the Roman history, in the Roman life. And now you can see a wonderful painting uh, by the British artist of Dutch descent, Lawrence Alma Tadema. Uh, the painting is entitled The Roses of Heliogabalus. Um, the, it is a painting of the 19th century and it represents an event of which we do not know for sure whether it happened or it did not happen in the history of ancient Rome. The scene depicted here took place at the feast at the banquet of the Roman Emperor uh, Heliogabalus, or uh, he is called Elagabalus, who lived in the 3rd century AD. He ordered to have rose petals be thrown from the ceiling uh, down to the guests, but the number of these uh, rose petals was so large the amount of roses was so that uh, uh, all the persons who were invited for the banquet, all of his enemies, suffocated under the weight of those petals. And in this painting we can see indeed this peaceful actually scene and uh, a sea of roses. Uh, and finally we start to discern faces of uh, the already suffocating people uh, between those petals. On the foreground, there is uh, Heliogabalus himself observing the this, this scene. This emperor was one of the uh, most cruel and gruesome in the history of the Roman Empire, but luckily he did not uh, rule for long. Uh, he ruled uh, between 218th and 222nd AD. And now we need to come back to Trimalchio and to the work uh, which actually uh, demonstrates what a wealthy Roman would or could have on the table. From the text written by Petronius, we now know the menu of this dinner, this banquet. So what do we actually know about this dinner? It was a very long banquet. It opened with appetizers, and uh, as the starters, uh, guests were offered green olives and black olives, dormice glazed with honey and poppy seed. Dormice are actually funny uh, little animals, but unfortunately they are very popular in ancient Rome as uh, starters, and they were usually cooked with honey and poppy. Guests were also offered beef sausage served on a grill, Syrian plum, pomegranate seeds, wine berries with pepper and yolk sauce, and honey wine. When the main course was offered to the guests, it was accompanied by Falernian wine, and not simply Falernian, but it was a hundred years old, centenary Falernian wine. Trimalchio was particularly proud of it. At the same time, a tray was bought for the, uh, brought uh, to the guests with a honeycomb and 12 signs of the zodiac. Uh, against each symbol, there were different kinds of food. Over Ares, chickpeas. Over Taurus, beef steak. The Gemini had testicles and kidneys. Against a cancer was a garland. Uh, against Leo, African fig. Uh, Virgo had young sow's other. Libre, a balance with cheesecake in one pan and pastry in the other. Scorpio had sea scorpion. Sagittarius had sea brim with eye spots. Capricorn, lobster. Aquarius, goose, and Pisces had mullets. This tray was followed by other dishes, which included poultry, pork, other, hare, fish, and pepper sauce, fried hog with baskets of Syrian and Theban dates uh, in, the teeth, in its teeth, lied with piglets uh, sculpted from dough, and pigs stuffed with sausages. In the end of the dinner came dessert, or sweet corn. It included a dish of pastries with a dough figure of Priapus in the center, holding a basket with apples and other fruits. Uh, sweet course also included well-fed uh, poulard, 
from which all bones were removed with goose eggs as a garnish. Blackbirds stuffed with raisins and nuts are apples, ham in the shape of a goose, lined with fish and poultry. As we can see, Roman dessert was not necessarily a sweet dish. On the screen you can see now uh, a fresco from one of the tombs in Pompeii uh, with the image of a table and various silverware on it, um, a set of uh, silver tableware. Silver was introduced into the uh, everyday life of wealthy Romans at, uh, approximately at that time. Silverware was extremely popular uh, in the houses of wealthy Roman aristocrats, um, and there were even special laws regulating the post amount of expense of dinners and other receptions. Roman author of the second century AD, Aulus Gilius, uh, mentions in his Noctis Attice. Um, the Emilian law, which was adopted in uh, 115 BC, uh, which was set in a limit not on the expense of dinners, but on the kind and quantity of food. He also mentions another law, according to which um, uh, Roman citizens uh, were prohibited, um, were instructed uh, to use a table uh, not more than 100 pounds weight of silverware, which was about 45 kilos. It is all the more amazing, because uh, such an abundance of Roman silver uh, has preserved in the form of hoards or treasures, and is now present in the collections of very many museums. There are several uh, well-known huge treasures of silver. Uh, one of them is the so-called Hildesheim treasure, which was unearthed um, in 1868 in Hildesheim in Lower Saxony. This treasure includes uh, 69 pieces of silver uh, from the 1st century BC, 1st centuries AD. It is lavish silverware, tableware, um, and one of the pieces found in this treasure is the um, dish. A, re a remarkable uh, masterpiece of antique uh, sculptors and specialists working with metal, as well as those masters who ca cast it in silver. It is a truly admirable work of art. Among the pieces from this treasure, there are such strange um, objects as, for example, scythes and cup, as this one, uh, where you can see images of skeletons. Uh, perhaps this series can be called a memento mori, kind of warning or a message to the uh, feast participants. Uh, one should leave, but never forget about death. Um, another very interesting treasure of uh, silver pieces was found at the Villa Bosco Reale. It is an ancient Roman villa in the south of Italy, a few kilometers away from Pompeii. In the ancient uh, days, the uh, surroundings of this villa were used for hunting, and they give a, uh, these lands give us a wonderful example of the atmosphere in the uh, countryside villas and how ancient Romans uh, lived uh, outside cities in the villas, for example, at the Villa Bosco Reale. Uh, here, uh, several remarkable rooms were discovered, decorated with frescoes. Uh, from there, we have fragments depicting, for example, a dame, a lady uh, playing music, or a ship of Dionysus and Selenus, or, for example, this uh, still life with fruit and in a uh, glass vase. There are also um, other beautiful scenes on the uh, walls of the Villa Bosco Reale. One of the pieces found there is uh, this, for example, it is not a dish, it is a backside of a mirror. Here we can see an image of Lida, uh, and uh, Zeus, uh, who has come uh, as sworn to her. Another highly elegant pieces were these scythoses. 
Uh, on one, you can see a scene of uh, Emperor Augustus receiving vanquished barbarians. Uh, on another, uh, Scythus, we see Emperor Tiberius and his triumph. These are the scenes that we can actually see on Roman triumphal arches. Yet another large uh, treasure of uh, silverware was discovered on the territory of France, in Normandy. It is the so-called Berteville treasure, which was found in the um, commune of Berteville in Normandy in 1830. Here we can see calyxes, uh, bases, dishes, statues of Mercury, as well as various spoons and goblets. Uh, one goblet or cup is particularly interesting. Uh, here we can see a god of seas, Poseidon, and his uh, companions. Um, this uh, goblet is made of silver and uh, uh, decorated with gilding. It is a cup dedicated to Mercury by Quintus Demetrius Tutus. Each piece Each cup that we see in these uh, treasures is a true masterpiece from the ancient era by the wonderful craftsmen who worked with metal, particularly silver. And here we can see a mosaic, which is currently stored in the museum Bardo in Tunis, which depicts a wine goblet, a wine cup, and a bottle in a basket. And next to it, a glass bottle, which was found almost intact, and a similar glass cup, uh, which means that something that we can see on the mosaic was well familiar to the artist who made this mosaic. It means that, that this artist used these utensils in his everyday life. A uh, bottle probably or definitely contains wine as long as the goblet is next to it. I'm showing this exact piece here just because it is a very beautiful and very famous mosaic. Coming back to the topic of uh, banquets and feasts, um, they were, of course, not only bright events filled with a huge and monstrous variety of uh, different food. First of all, uh, it was all about wine drinking, uh, wines uh, sometimes very expensive and really good. Here you can see a wall painting from a triclinium in Villa Livia in Rome. It is yet another well-known monument uh, of a monumental painting uh, of the first century BC, first century AD. The villa is decorated with uh, such frescoes, uh, as we can see here, by the painting that resembles a kind of a paradise garden with fruit, uh, fruit um, trees, birds, flowers, all at the same time. We feel the atmosphere of uh, full relaxation in the nature with uh, lights and elegant wine, probably very, very expensive, as was the case with Falernian wine. And here it is the right place for us to remember a famous poem Uh, which uh, was written by a Roman poet of the first century BC. Uh, Gaius Valerius Catullus lived uh, not a very long life, but he was a very bright poet, and he left a poem which is uh, well known for Russian audience in the translation by the great Russian poet Pushkin. It is uh, known for the first line, which mentions the Falernian wine. Here is one of the English translations of this poem, of this verse. Boy, bearer of the long-stored Falernian, fill our cups with wine that is drier, according to the behest of Postumia, the mistress of our feast, who is mellower than the mellow grape. As for you, insipid water, bane of good wine, hence, be gone, take yourself off to the straight laced. Here science song shall reign alone. From this poem, it looks like Catullus um, states that Romans prefer pure wine to the wine mixed with water, as it was in Greece. But we uh, should say that this tradition of mixing wine with water uh, has continued in the Roman Empire, as well as the wonderful tradition of table talks. 
And if we are to talk um, about uh, similarities or um, something common between the food culture and uh, um, food and meals and cuisine uh, of ancient Greeks and ancient Romans, um, here are the conclusions that we can make. If we remember the uh, first lecture uh, about ancient Greeks, we should say that they uh, had valued very high the uh, symposium. Uh, we are judging from the legacy that have left to us. Um, at these symposiums, uh, all different various types of uh, interesting uh, vessels were used, uh, ceramic vessels, beautifully painted vases of uh, different shapes. And all these shapes functionally were uh, closely connected with the theme of feasting and drinking. These vases and uh, dishes were also very elegantly painted. Um, and even though sometimes there were some kind of uh, Dionys Dionysus scenes, uh, wild scenes, uh, the drawing itself always remained uh, admirable. And the subjects of this painting uh, also very often give um, the possibility of having nice, serious, or maybe not that serious, conversation. So a symposium, a feast uh, for the Greeks was a merry pastime, but also um, clever uh, eating and drinking. Uh, it was not about uh, food, it was all about wine, and wine mixed with water. While thinking of all the uh, literature that the Roman authors left behind, uh, thinking of all those feasts and uh, banquets as uh, the Trimalchio's dinner, we understand that uh, Romans were unparalleled in their um, love for gourmandism and even gluttony and their accent for uh, various uh, fancy food. Because uh, in opuses, uh, opicus, we sometimes find such a combination of ingredients and such elaborate recipes that they uh, can never be rivaled. Though at the Roman banquet there certainly was place both for conversation and for dances and declamation and serious talks. But the cult of food, that is uh, what was in the first place for the Romans. And yet, both Rome and Greece still remained for us an inexhaustible source of uh, various information, wonderful stories and unique works of uh, art. As Roman, uh, as Greek um, vases, painted vases, as antique frescoes, as antique mosaics or works of applied art. Everything which you have just seen on screen. Thank you.